Okay. I'm going to uh, go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to uh, this week's seminar. I am very excited to uh, welcome Sarah Curran, who is a professor in the Jackson School of International Studies and in the Evans School and in sociology here at the University of Washington, and also leads the Center for Social Demography no, no, no. Studies no, in demography and ecology. I knew CSE is no, just no. Uh, uh, And uh, she's somebody that I was excited to meet and, and as part of my interview process because of, both because of my involvement in population studies at the University of Michigan and collaborations, interdisciplinary collaborations, which I see as potential opportunities for us here as well, and so there are some of those already, certainly, and um, I'm interested in exploring more of them. But also because we've been at some of the same places, even at the same time. Uh, in one case, uh, we both got our PhDs at the University of North Carolina a long time ago. Mine, just for her sake, is, was longer ago than hers. So. <laughs> but uh, but uh, she also did her uh, undergraduate work in natural resources at the University of Michigan. Uh, which was before I got there, but uh, so we sort of have crossed at various times. So I'm very excited uh, to hear about your work and, on demographic uh, dynamics and population responses to varying natural hazard exposures. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, really uh, happy to take uh, in interruptions at any point. I'm really glad to be down here. Um, one of our ideas this year when Dan got here was to try to do more uh, exchanges of research. So we'd love to have some um, School of Forestry, School of Environment and Forest Sciences up in up in our end of campus, a little bit of ways up there in Ray Hall. And uh, and we, we would really look forward to that and would love to encourage collaborations. Pr quickly, the Center for Studies in Demography and Ecology um, is uh, a mouthful but it is uh, funded by the National Institute of Health as a population uh, research center through an infrastructure grant. And um, the ecology is not what you think it is. It's, it relates to human ecology, a field that has disappeared um, and been absorbed into geography and regional studies, regional planning, et cetera. Um, but our center, because our center has been around since 1950s, if not maybe a little bit before that, and, um, and so we have this holdover of a name. Uh, that said, we do have faculty, uh, we affiliate faculty, we have a training program, a certificate program in demographic methods. It's open to anybody, any uh, master's PhD student on campus and teaches you how to do demographic estimations and, uh, of all sorts. And, um, and uh, we have affiliations for faculty of any type <laughs> and interest. And we have an affinity group in, um, within the center for those people who are interested in population and environment, as well as affinity groups around health of people, populations, uh, families, and household well-being, uh, and demographic methods, and uh, migration and settlement. So if any of those topics are of interest to you, or if you'd like to have a, be a part of that community, we welcome you and uh, look forward to hearing from you. This is a project that's a collaborative one um, with, uh, uh, as you see, a number of faculty. One of them is affiliated with one of your colleagues here, um, Matt Dunbar. <laughs> and uh, Matt is our uh, GIS uh, uh, specialist and research scientist at the Center for Studies in Demography and Ecology. Um, so this is a US-based project. Much of my research has mostly been in Southeast been research conducted in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and Thailand in particular, but uh, we were turning our attention for a number of reasons to the U.S. and uh, trying to get do a better job from our vantage point of doing uh, social science research in this area. So it's very preliminary still, and I look forward to your feedback um, on it. Well, obviously this is, you know, a um, Climate change is happening, and usually that gets a chuckle because of, you know, um, well, we have people who are doubters. 
Um, there are, uh, but what's increasingly obvious is uh, the, the relationship between uh, how populations respond to climate uh, change is notably complex. It looks like uh, interactions between behaviors and institutions. One of the demands that this, uh, this problem requires is we need data with more spatial and temporal depth um, so that we can begin to dis disentangle um, the slow and rapid impacts. Um, and we need some more data that accounts for heterogeneity and exposure and impacts uh, to climate change um, phenomena. Our team is made up of lots of people from UW, um, but Beth Fussell at, the, at Brown is uh, uh, known for her work on Katrina and the post-Katrina, um, post-migration impacts and then re-migration back to New Orleans after Katrina that led to a real population mixing, uh, growing heterogeneity and the distribution and uh, composition of the population in, in New Orleans. Um, uh, Jacqueline Meyer and I have done work in Thailand looking at drought and its relationship to um, migration. And um, Jacqueline had done some work on flooding and flooding uh, disaster effects on, on migration. Um, <clears throat> and Loya Thompson, who is here and at the, who ran the uh, program on climate impact, no, uh, program on climate change. Uh, in atmospheric sciences, and then Mike Babin and, and Matt are the geographers who do our estimations. So quickly, I'll just give you our take on, um, on the previous research. There's a, some work that's been done around climate-related disasters and population response. Uh, some work on environmental amenities that we'll review quickly, and population responses. We've got very mixed results in the literature. I'll talk to you a bit about insights from demography and some recent, more recent conceptualizations and connections that I talk. So um, there, in the IPCC report in uh, 2014, there was a, in 2007 actually, there was a fair amount of um, concern around possibilities of environmental refugees. Um, the 2007 report was much more alarmist about this. By 2014, the concerns were a bit more conditioned. Um, and in particular, uh, there was a recognition that people are staying put longer than we expected. And in fact, our work in Thailand showed that people were staying put for fairly long periods of exposure to drought before they would up and leave um, their, their communities. Um, so un understanding that that holding mechanism of place and the um, disruption of climate change is, is, seems to be something important to uncover. Um, some important work by Susan Cutter's group um, out of South Carolina where she's been looking at social vulnerability and the distribution, variable distribution of impacts across mostly in the United States uh, of, of natural disasters on communities. And increasingly, there's a literature that suggests there's a whether it can be a forcing mechanism. These, this, these citations reflect a few uh, different projects in, that have examined this. Um, and uh, what is notable here is that these effects appear to differ depending on how the weather event, what part, what, what does the weather event affect? Does it affect your house, your crops, your health? And therefore, what is your response, your response to staying in a place in, in, in relation to that particular focused effect? The environmental amenities literature suggests completely the opposite set of trends, possibly in relation to population. That is, um, people move to places that have higher amenities, um, and that in particular, I just just to alert you to the fact that. Uh, mo uh, many people are moving to coastal areas in the United States, which in turn are more vulnerable to climate change impacts to some extent. Um, and then also place-based atta attachments are quite deep-rooted, which makes it hard sometimes to um, uh, get people to adapt by moving out of the place. Um, again, as I've been intimating, there are lots of mixed empirical results, especially um, in the United States, 
Um, some studies, Schultz and Elliott, have shown that when uh, disasters hit particularly urban places, you see um, with high dollar losses, you see actually subsequently an increase in the population. Uh, there's other places, like that, as I mentioned earlier, Beth Fussell's work uh, shows something of a population churning, that there's some mobility, lots of people moving in and out, and in fact, the composition changes. Uh, other research has shown that um, there's a migrant selectivity. This would also be associated with uh, Susan Cutter work that some people are more likely to be pushed out, that they're selected for, that the disaster has a selective effect on particular people and that those people will move out. Those who are very poor and have the fewest, fewest resources may be less likely to move. <clears throat> and then finally, um, uh, more recently, we have, uh, uh, Jacqueline and I have been working on this idea of cumulative exposure. That is, as you're uh, exposed more frequently to more frequent events, your response, uh, uh, you may hit a threshold in which you leave, but we need to account for that cumulative exposure rather than look at just one impact, one event uh, at, at, at a time. Um, so I just would say that from a demographer's point of view, one of the things we're interested in is this population dynamic. And uh, there are two things to keep in mind as a demographer. We know that demographic momentum doesn't shift easily. It's one of your basic tenets from a demographic methods course. And uh, the second is that um, that cumulative exposure, whether that's um, exposure to uh, particular kinds of ideas, or migration can accelerate, can, can lead to a nonlinear response and accelerating acceleration of behavior, but it can also be a, a slowdown and a doubling down and, uh, to, to staying in place. Finally, uh, demographers are very, very concerned about selectivity and heterogeneity and behaviors and being able to take those into account when summarizing to a population level. Any questions so far about what I've just giving you that, that background of what we do, is how we think about things as demographers. Yes? What is selectivity? Selectivity is um, that uh, not everybody um, behaves the same way, and some people are more likely to, to move, and that selection might be actually something, if you, if you don't account for it, uh, it can, can sometimes be an unobserved variable that confounds your understanding of what's happening. So you need to be able to make sure you understand that. So my, for example, in my field of migration, we know that um, generally migrants are selected on not being uh, uh, younger, I mean beyond school, but not yet married, um, having some education, some resources, um, there's, a, there's a process that selects people out. There also may be a policy context that selects people into being moved. Thank you, good question. Um, uh, okay, well recently, I think this is a very interesting paper if any of you are studying climate, um, climate research and, and the, the, the relationship between climate and socioeconomic phenomenon. This paper by uh, Carlton and Xiang is trying to take an epidemiological, conceptually an epidemiological approach to uh, climate and suggesting that there is this idea of dose response and exposure that um, modifies socio, uh, social and economic responses to climate. One of the things that I picked up on in the paper, and I'll return to this and show you a few pictures from that paper at the end of my talk. But um, one of the things that I picked up on in the paper is that they made the assumption that there is not much happening vis-a-vis -vis populations. Population isn't changing, which as a demographer I would you know, say that's actually, actually not true. So we're going to try to uh, work on adding to and think through elaborating this particular model, but I, thought, I think it's quite interesting and worthy for, for others to know about. Um, so uh, uh, we would say, you know, preliminary synthesis of earlier work is that population responses to natural hazard events are going to vary 
depending on how often, uh, how much exposure a population typically experiences and how large the disaster. Um, population responses are going to vary depending on the capacity to respond. Um, and that capacity might be, um, could be captured, we're going to suggest it's captured in our case, by um, what, what might be uh, inferred from past population trends, so how, how past population trends might be a signal about capacity, um, community size, and density. We are not able to capture any of these yet, these uh, institutional capacities or individual capacities. I'd love to hear from you what you think. Um, and that maybe response and recovery time from after a disaster might be signals of adapted capacities of some sort. It could be positive or negative. Um, we take a repurposed and matched county year data set um, uh, that looks at um, counties in the U.S. from 1970 to 2014, and we put um, Build that data set or built it on based on the spatial hazard events and losses database from the U.S. called Sheldus is the shorthand for that. Uh, have built, uh, based out of South Carolina, you can we have it at, at CSDE if you'd like it. Um, but uh, it is has hazards that cover all sorts of storm data and unusual weather phenomena. Um, it's by uh, actually it's recorded by uh, day, um, and it includes the zip code, locations, the type, whether it was declared or undeclared disaster, recorded dollar losses, <coughs> type of damage, and damage link losses and any injuries and fatalities. We also, it also records multiple hazard types, so it's got fire and drought and uh, uh, hail and um, uh, hurricanes and major storm events. Then we merge those data uh, with um, county level intercensal annual intercensal estimates for, um, from 1970 through 2014 and we calculate a compound annual population growth rate, uh, annual population growth rate. Very simple, we add to that um, county data on population size and density. Um, so very, really, really simple data set so far. So our first paper published in this um, was a, a year and a half ago out of um, the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science and it was our first cut of doing this analysis. Um, and we looked just at three years, uh, just looked at, um, oh, I should back up for the data structure, I don't know if you, um, so this is county years, and then we look at that county year up through, uh, so for every county year, we then look at subsequently the next uh, three, three years from that county year, um, what, what was the compound annual population growth rate. So for that's you know ongoing, and every county has repeated observations over the years. I don't know how comfortable everybody is, but um, <clears throat> we estimated in this paper we estimate um, a regression based on the three-year uh, compound annual growth rate, um, and we regressed the U.S. dollar losses from a disaster in a current year, and then we look three years forward at the population growth rate. Um, and then we also regressed uh, the past, the accumulated exposure to uh, disasters, natural disasters, over the last 10 years. And controlling for the past years of population growth and uh, density. And what we found in our first wave is that um, any in a U.S. dollar losses in a current year does suppress population growth in the first three years. So once you're hit with a disaster, and if it's a large disaster, relatively large disaster, future population growth uh, is you know stalls, slows down. Um, but when you have are exposed to a cumulative number of disasters over time, that actually accelerates uh, population growth. So kind of a weird finding. 
and we um, we we were a little we looked for a while we split up our samples we looked at different kinds of counties so low low and high growth counties low and high densities and it turns out that most of that result is in these high growth high density counties so where you already have a fairly robust economy going on when you have a disaster that and cumulative number of disasters actually you have an acceleration of population growth in those counties any questions <laughs> why is that, is that, yeah. uh, is that because of the temporal structure of the data you're able to draw a causation or is that simply association it just so happens that the counties that are growing fastest are ones that have more disasters and more dollar losses from disasters because more the values are higher. More dollar losses. So exactly and we are on the cusp of being able to do the other exact question. We haven't done it. We just we just put on brought on board to our project a climate top climate weather meteorologist person who's going to help us measure objectively weather impacts independent of dollar losses so that we can get that back because dollar losses are a function of of built land environment and land value and everything, yeah. How, how much time are y'all considering between hurricane and ground storm events? Are y'all considering to be a cumulative day? Ten years. Ten years. Mm -hmm. So multiple happenings. Mul multiple happenings, yeah. How, I mean, do you know how your head money, like specific geographies that you have that have had multiple in the past few years? Yeah, well, on average, um, I'll, I'll show you a picture in a second. Well, let me just get to, I'll show you some distributions in a second, but um, what we are doing now is building off of that. So we tested these three hypotheses in that earlier paper. Now what we're looking at is the effect on future growth one year, three years, and five years out. So making the assumption that actually responses, the growth rates are going to respond differently uh, over time. And um, also that there's an interaction between the hazard and the conditions, namely the population growth and the density. So we, we try to tease it out with the data that we have um, here. This is our general structure of our um, of our dependent variable um, and our independent measures are compound annual growth rate for the past decade for each county year, uh, population density in a particular county year at the time, uh, natural hazard event in a year, whether or not it occurred, so a dummy variable for that, uh, U.S. dollar losses in um, millions per capita in 2014 dollars, so standardized across time. Uh, cumulative number of natural hazards for the past decade and the cumulative U.S. dollar losses for the past decade. So first let me show you a few maps. Um, just, yes, yes? I just said yay maps. <laughs> love, love to collaborate with an LULC person who has county level land use, historic land use, land cover change. So. Yes, if you want to talk. Um, so these are pictures of loss, losses. Uh, this is in a single year in 2008, um, and these are for any loss, any, any kind of loss, uh, any natural disaster loss, drought, fire, whatever. Uh, this is accumulated over one particular decade, 1998 to 2007. Um, you can see there's some concentrations, patterns, uh, you know, through the Midwest. Uh, along um, along the western coast here, obviously along the Gulf Coast, <clears throat> flooding up in the far reaches of Maine and places where it gets very cold. Um, in any one year, you have a particular pattern. Then over a 10-year period, somewhat repeated, but it, you you see a more standard. Uh, you know, more average, average looking picture of what we would expect. Yes, Dan? Are there known reporting biases in these data? Um, well, they've done, a, they, they've been working on these data for I think almost 10 years and they've been uh, working on the reliability and, and the validity. So, um, you know, in early on, when it was first developed, there were reporting biases because of the sources of data, but they've done a lot more to try and relate those sources. And I, but I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly, but they, they, they weathered, so to speak, <laughs> a lot of criticism. Um, 
but it does have, there are some weird things that happen. So I, I, when you look at the data, uh, let's see, um, like this, these particular, like this particular picture of droughts, um, and uh, I think this was, I don't remember what year this is a picture of, um, but you know, the fact that it goes along the state boundary here is obviously a problem. So when we first started looking at these patterns of um, floods and hail is a little different, tornadoes are a little different, but floods and droughts, and we saw these state line boundaries, we immediately had that question. So why is it that we're getting a report here, but not um, north of Texas? So related to specific disaster declarations? Or well, it's not all disaster declaration data, so it's whether people are reporting losses and, and dollar estimates of losses. So, and those are generated through newspaper accounts, through a number of different sources, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we decided that um, hurricanes were the ones we wanted. We wanted to focus on hurricanes. Um, it's the most costly of um, natural disasters. <coughs> um, we felt the best about hurricane data uh, in the data set and, um, and felt we could wrap our heads around how it would be related. You would get a population signal from exposure to a hurricane event, a storm event. Um, uh, so one thing to note here is that um, most hurricanes, there are a few, few can't, might not see it up here, but there are hurricanes <coughs> Big storm events along all the coasts, but most of it, mostly it's in this Gulf Coast, um, southeastern Atlantic coast. Uh, that said, um, population growth has also been happening in these places. So, uh, you know, it's kind of setting up a pretty big test to see what would be a population response given that on average uh, over the period 1970 to 2009, we're, we're seeing uh, a fair amount of population growth into these counties. Not entirely, there's some heterogeneity there, but variation, but still. Um, and uh, population density also uh, in similarly, some variability across the Gulf Coast, uh, east, southeastern coast. Um, most population change, most of the decline in populations happen through the mid Midwest and the middle middle belt of the country. Um, and um, so this is the, uh, this is 1998 to 2008, and you see a little bit of a slowing of that population decline um, in the later part of the decade. This is shown here. So one of the other things about these data that we Sort of struggled with is that there was um, a lot more population uh, dynamic dynamics happening in the earlier part of the decades than in the later part of the decades. Um, and I didn't even ask you how much time we have because I don't want to worry. <laughs> okay. Um, so we began our analyses with hurricanes because hurricanes account for two-thirds of the total cumulative dollar losses in the U.S. Pretty high quality data. Hurricanes result in housing loss, so we think we're going to get a fairly large population signal, you know, response. And um, they occur over this relatively limited spatial domain, and we can be fairly certain that that particular place got hit with this event. Um, so we had selected counties that had ever experienced a tropical hurricane or tropical storm between 2007 and 2009. And then we observed population change from uh, 10 years, so from 1981 to 2014. So we're looking from that 19, we wanted to make sure we could account for the 10 year decadal change in population growth. So we start our clock at 1980 and we go and look at one year, three year, and five year at every year subsequently after 1980. Um, so to answer your question about the um, uh, average um, 
hurricane, so we have 35,000 plus county years. And, um, and uh, we have almost one hurricane on average for our county, so um, for our county years. So that's a pretty high number. Obviously, we selected on having had at least one anyway. Um, so, and then um, you can see the general, um, just, just, you know, general average, average mean compound annual growth rate from T plus one, T plus three, T plus five, relatively small growth rates. Um, uh, generally, on average, most counties are on average declining in terms of their population over time in the previous 10 years. Uh, population density is 424 on average per square meter mile. Any questions? Um, okay, just this. Um, I don't These are just the similar, just a little bit easier to read. So we ran a random effects generalized least squares um, regression estimation and we adjust for the error terms at the clusters at the county level so that we don't over infer um, statistical significance and take into account the correlation between counties. Um, and uh, we have a couple of different models. So we have a base model where we look at the effect regress population density, historic growth, density times growth, the event, cumulative events, annual loss, and cumulative loss. Uh, and then we test a bunch, several different kinds of interactions, which I'll show you here, three-way interactions. And I'll show you the results of that. Um, and evaluate the R-square improvement and um, look at the predicted, um, predicted rates. Holding other things constant. So this is our um, coefficients for the uh, base model, one year, three years, and five years, and I'll just highlight a few things here. So when we look at um, the historic annual population growth rate, we see that on, for the most part, you have a declining rate of, uh, you know, if you had an increase in the growth, you're going to have a subsequent declining rate. In other words, in general, you know, there's a slowing of the population growth rate on average for most, most counties. Um, and <coughs> population density is a fairly small, non relatively non-significant effect, although the interaction here is that with population density you get a slight bump up in the annual growth rate in, with an interaction. And I'm just, I'm gonna leave the interpretation here, you'll see some why it has later. Um, generally, uh, the cumulative effect, uh, cumulative exposure uh, has a positive effect on the compound annual growth rate in one year out, three years out, and five years out, and pretty, pretty much the same effect over time. Um, in any one year, if you're hit, the dollar amount actually does have a negative effect. That negative effect is larger in the first year than in the subsequent third year and fifth year, which also makes sense, because you have the countervailing investments that are happening after an event. <coughs> um, um, any, but the number of hurricanes has a small but significant negative effect. So what we're seeing is that um, exposure to events um, the cumulative exposure over a decade to any event has a negative effect on the population, but if the losses are high, meaning there's something about the place and the value of that property, you're going to have, um, you know, a positive effect on the population. That, am I like twist? So more hurricanes, you get less population growth, but higher value losses, you get more growth. Mm -hmm. And again, there's little effect of any exposure of any hurricane in, in a year. It's not going to have an effect on population growth rate subsequently. One, three, five. So, um, 
So then um, I ran, um, we ran several interactions, three-way interactions, looking at the decadal growth rate and the pop density times the annual loss um, and times the cumulative loss. <coughs> and, um, and times the annual hurricane exposure to the cumulative number of exposures. So in both of these cases, there's no, no improvement in our model, no significant, statistically significant effect of that three-way interaction. These are separate, separate models, separate estimations, separate equations. Um, but we do see positive, significant interaction effect, three-way interactions in the direction that we were expecting, um, some, somewhat in the direction of additional acceleration in population growth rate with, a, with a high, you know, historically higher um, increasing population growth rates, historically higher pop density, higher cumulative losses, you get an even greater acceleration of the growth rate. And um, <coughs> it grows from one year out to the third year and the fifth year. Um, for the annual dollar loss, you get uh, a big, relatively negative suppression on the growth rate, and then that suppress that that effect sort of starts to diminish over time. Is it? Are we do interpret that annual versus cumulative as the annual. You see a an immediate dip and then an increase and then sort of rebound mm -hmm. to the years getting, getting closer, closer to, to zero. zero. Mm -hmm. Whereas the cumulative, yeah, it's so it's just going right. So the so this is one event or a lot yeah. of loss at, at one time versus the resilience that comes with the cumulative, the cumulative exposure. exposure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to think it through. So we did some pictures. <laughs> um, so this is that um, this is the that first row that this is the these are some pictures from this estimating the Y the Y hat, you know, predicted of the Y um, for different kinds of counties um, one year in the future. If you are a declining county, which would be the blue in the middle, you can hardly see it, um, a growth county but low, low pop density, and I think we should, these are important, um, historically growing in high population density counties and historically declining high population density counties. So different types of counties with different kinds of growth patterns um, respond dif you know, differently to these, this effect, this interaction effect. And what we're seeing actually is that growth, historic growth, counties that are experiencing a fair amount of high growth and their low pop population density, they actually get this boom. That would be suburban areas that are not directly on the coast but are near metro areas, spillover counties that might be experiencing some of this growth. That's one year. That, that over time, that growth diminishes. So you see by five years, there's really, really very little difference between the, those types of counties in terms of their growth rates. So we look at the, if we look at the um, cumulative dollar loss, so that's the, this other equation. Oops, oh, sorry. Um, oh no, I'm going totally the wrong way. Um, sorry, make you dizzy. This equation, so we're doing the y's, the predicted y's for this particular equation. Um, uh, where are we? Um, yeah, cumulative losses, one year in the future. Um, this is this yellow bar here, the stand, that standard errors around those particular counties estimation. So historically, Growing counties, high population density. Your green is your low growth density. Low, high growth, low population density places. Um, this blue is historically declining low population. So these are your rural counties, these are your suburban counties. Um, and uh, sort of declining cities are the red in the middle here. Uh, historic growth, high pop density places. 
Um, so one year in the future, with cumulative loss, so what we're seeing is that those places that are high growth, high pop density are the ones that are the ones that are accelerating in the first year, in the third, three years out, and five years out. So actually, again, not a lot of variability there, but still ongoing continued growth. Any questions? Yes. Is anywhere in your in your approach taking into account the amount of money that came in? Not to, yet. To the disaster? Right. Okay. Right. Um, that, that's a good question, obviously. We know there's major reinvestment in places like New Orleans. As part of what the As earlier this, work showed in New Orleans. Yeah, a exactly. Lot of money. Sure, but, but more to my way of thinking is some communities get hit by a disaster and everybody goes, yeah, whatever. Right, and other communities get hit. Yeah. Oh my God, we have to do something. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And that difference in political will uh -huh. has got to be in the data somehow. Uh huh. And I would love to add it somehow. Yeah, because yeah. I think that institutional caring, that cap capacity to notice and care and do something about it is not in our data. I don't know quite how we, one would capture it. I guess you could look at budget allocations. From disaster the federal government, dollars, yeah. disaster dollars. Yeah, you might you might expect to see some variation with population density, mm -hmm. so that the higher population density areas are going to have more mm -hmm. climate. Mm -hmm. Not in the electoral college. <laughs> when it comes to disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're trying to build this database. We'd love help with building the database. Anybody wants to add to it, create new variables that add to our database. I think there's a lot to be done here. Um, we think that it really is a big correction. Most of the literature on natural hazards looks at very short temporal periods, looks at specific hazard events, doesn't really compare across space. And one of the things that um, and also doesn't take into the fact that there's this ongoing momentum, population momentum, that is driving, can be driving, and creates either some possibilities for endogenous accelerated growth or, or not. So um, that hasn't been taken into account before. Um, and then nobody's really looked at the one, three, and five years out um, across periods. Um, finally, the fact that we, we, we make the case that cumulative exposure really should become a little more systematic, examined more often and more systematically. Um, I think I've pretty much explained our summary of our effects. Um, U.S. losses and exposure sort of have, do have distinct impacts. Um, dollar losses have larger effects than exposure measures. Um, and cumulative is works in the opposite direction than annual. Um, um, I'm just going to say that there are these high growth, high density counties and high growth, low density counties that um, should be pay, paid attention to in terms of their responsiveness to climate or climate related natural disasters. Um, uh, you know, we're just playing around with these different kinds of counties and how to think about these counties, whether that's um, something about their, their experiencing spillovers during, in the short term, um, uh, in those like annual effects measures, um, and whether there are these ma major investments in high growth, high density counties, and some costs in infrastructure that just require reinvestment, political mobilization, and reinvestment dollars. This is a picture, I'm gonna, I, I think, I'm gonna skip, because I'd rather have a conversation. This is just a picture, of, a couple pictures, and you'll have my slides, I'm happy to share them, but, um, of how um, different countries, depending on exposure, uh, the, the amount of exposure to different kinds of events, how different countries respond differently. Um, in, in particular, this is one that I, Think, build, you know, it coincides with what we're arguing. If you have a very, very few, um, like if you experience very few cyclones and then you're in the first quintile, the impact on your economy, on you as a country, is quite large. Um, 
Uh, and, but if you've had exposure to a fair number of cyclones over decades, you adapt and you become more resilient. You're not going to have that big, any one particular exposure isn't really going to have that great of an impact. So I think thinking about countries, places, adaptive capacities, investments that people are doing for mitigation, how that relates to population responses is something that hasn't been fully explored but should be recognized, especially since we've got mitigation and adaption processes going on at the same time. Um, what we're going to be doing next is um, eval evaluating more nonlinear effects, the objective weather measures. So we're looking at temperature and temp temperature extremes, wind, uh, wind. Um, speed and uh, precipitation and extreme precipitation as measures of, ex of exposure and intensity of exposure independent of the loss measures. So we can get a better, a more, a measure that matches better with those US dollar losses because we suspect that those are swamping out some of these natural, underlying natural hazard exposures. Um, I think that's it. That's it. Thank you. Questions, comments, I can go back. Yeah. Fire was not one of like the big disasters on the map that had all of the different US yeah. things on it. And I'm wondering like yeah. are you interested That's in like, it in the future? Because yeah. I think of it as like a very noticeable sure. natural disaster here on the West of Coast. Of course. Yeah. Um, yes. So there they do capture fire, at the time that we first generated these maps, fire wasn't that big a deal, and it didn't show up that clearly on the maps. Yeah. So, but maybe What's the more source recent. Data? The shell data? The, the, the shell the, the source of the fire. It's all, the, all of those natural disasters are shell -less. But I don't know exactly. Their right, 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 I don't know. And, yeah. you know how complete a record yeah. is that? The other thing to keep in mind, and actually when we were talking about fires, is, uh, well, just a lot of natural. Um, so much of the climate and population um, analyses uh, doesn't look at a rasterized kind of perspective on space. So it only looks at particular places where people live. And so other things like fire or, you know, there. Lot, climate is effects and weather effects and drought and everything are happening across the entire landscape. And um, I think we, we should be thinking better about that um, in a more geographic, spatial way. Yeah. Monica? <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not quite sure how that, I don't know quite how to put that together with the population piece, but I, I think that we over in either under or over infer effects by not taking into account the, the underlying processes. Just like I was arguing about demography, there's underlying demographic processes that need to be taken into account before you sort of assume that people are going to up and leave and become environmental refugees. So, sorry, that was wandering response. Yeah. I, um, so I was trying to infer from what Sure. Which uh, were inappropriate to infer. So I will ask people to speculate on my inferences that they can make, which are so the last sort of end, you make the comment uh, looking at international, the international stuff, saying the places that get more uh, you know, disasters are more resilient to them. But I was kind of looking at it, and I couldn't quite get it. If I look at hurricane stuff, I look at counties, I would guess that people who, ex who have for generations as part of a culture lived with um, hurricanes are more resilient and therefore places, so, and I couldn't tell if it was like, you know, rural places that are declining, yeah. blah, 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 compared to places that are rapidly increasing, so just there's a lot of new people who probably don't have a sense. Mm -hmm. A place for, for mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Yes, I do, so and I, I think know if I could get that no, result. that that is that is exactly right, and um, um, that is what I was implying in my introduction that that 
there are maybe places where people just do not want to leave because, because they've been there forever, their family's been there forever, they survived it forever. Um, and then there are other kinds of places that where you maybe had a return or you've got maybe more mobile population um, for, for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're less place. I mean, there's also the selection of people who know that they're moving to a place that has hurricanes. They may put that in their calculus, and right? So there's the selection of who's moving to places like this. Um, and that, that may be heterogeneous. Like, there may be those people who are up and ready to leave, and then there are people who are like, I came here, I, I, I'm staying. And so that piece I, we don't have here, because we would have to figure out a way to uh, come up with disaggregated population level data yeah. somehow, something about the composition of the population that would help us tease that out. Yeah. I think yeah. that's... Yeah, no, I can basically, uh, to what extent are there uh, hurricane impact and culture to say mm -hmm. that that's, mm -hmm. that's, they've always lived there, it's not like they're, um, you know, resistant to leave or whatever, yeah, right, right. And I think when I, the field work we were doing in Thailand, people were, for years, that's been, that was sort of the life of, they were used to, they're used to having drought. They, they, they have a culture of rice and production, agricultural production that is sort of built on the cycles of drought. The droughts happen to be getting longer and they last for longer, and, but it is their place and they have ways in which they adapt to it. Yeah, so I think, I think that's something we, that's more of an anthropological question maybe, but find, look, this could help figure out well, where could we look to see where are these communities. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm an anthropologist, so okay. following, following <laughs> on that um, comment, I'm curious how you would go about ground truthing this information. It's, from my vantage point, very big and abstract yeah. in general. And so would you work with, say, all those facilities and use interviews or yeah. ways to ground through some of your yeah. things about the why explanations for Right, right. Um, yeah, well, so in my fieldwork in Thailand, I do go and do interviews with communities. I've, I have never done one of these kinds of studies in this kind of big way before, so even though I am a marker. <laughs> um, so I am interested in the, that interaction, you know, research methods-wise, going from a big picture, general, generalized set of patterns to zooming into the particulars of place to sort of unpack some mechanisms that might be at work um, to explain patterns. So yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I think that there are these coastal communities where people will be there. I mean, they're going to stay there, even as the waters are creeping up and as they more. And our tendency is maybe to focus a little too much on these big cities. Not to say that we shouldn't focus on them. There are a lot of people there, and you know that might be a logical use of dollars, of our you know government dollars maybe. But um, there are other patterns to pay attention to. Yes. Yeah. Well, just maybe somebody else in that If anybody else, yes. I wonder when you talk about resilience, if, if some of it's stubbornness or just beaten down. What's the difference? <laughs> well, I think there's a difference. Your example from uh, Thailand suggested maybe resilience if their agriculture is adapted to this, you know, persistent service versus some of what I've seen in New Orleans where, you know, some of the people are staying just because that, that's their only option. Mm -hmm. And so can you... I wouldn't say that's stubborn. But That's more the beat down. Yeah, beat down. Yeah. Or the economic reality. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some of it may just be stubborn also mm -hmm. in some of the areas. And I wonder, can you tease those apart? Because if you're thinking about a strategy to adapt to climate change, the, the resilient strategy certainly seems a lot better than the just stubborn. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you would tease out. We have to continually reinvest you know, in popping communities such that are destroyed by fire or whatever it may be at versus are they have they come up with ways to Yeah. I don't I don't have an answer for you. 
Uh, I think it's an area, I think we need to think that more complexly about human responses. And that's my point. In my bigger point is that th these are a lot more complicated and um, we can use the general the, uh, spatial, temporal and spatial data to help us think about, oh, this looks like a very different kind of community. Let's drill down and figure out what's going on here. But our, so far, our institutional responses have been fairly uh, blunt and not refined enough, perhaps, and not empowering enough of people of the communities to make decisions about how they want to respond. Um, um, short of, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. I think that these are different kinds of research methods that help partially but not completely focus you. It takes an interdisciplinary team to figure this out. Yeah. So first of all, I'm sort of struck by how difficult your your work is. You know, like thinking of dealing with some sort of natural system that's complex enough, but add all the social, political, and economic mm -hmm. elements to it, it seems Really, really difficult. Okay, um, the yes. <laughs> the database that you have seems excellent for these extreme events. Right. Right. So you you have that. Mm -hmm. the, the question is, what other data might you bring to the mm -hmm. table mm -hmm. to test the type of things you want to? Right. You know, I don't know that this other information is is within the database that you have, but you it, it's almost begging for some sort of time series type analysis and comparisons mm -hmm. in there, and if it would be fruitful. And if one asks a question of something like resilience, and it's resilience to what, mm -hmm. you know, it might be something like, um, I, I draw it just to mind came like housing. Yeah. And what, what is the housing like before the disaster and after? Mm -hmm. And is it in fact more resilient now? Mm -hmm. If that was something that you were interested in, like mm -hmm. how many buildings are up on mm -hmm. uh, stills or right. you know, right. built materials? Yeah. I mean, there might be ways to get a hold of data that would allow you to, to try to probe into some of the things that you mm -hmm. seem to be most interested in. Yeah, so one thing we haven't, um, yeah, land, quality of housing, quality of in the infrastructure um, would be a measure. We haven't been, we did talk to Marina Alberti a little bit about that, but there isn't anything that covers the temp, the time frame that we're talking about. and. Um, or the space, as far as I know. There's insurance databases, so another thing we've been trying to go to is talk to insurance companies because we know probably that they have, I mean, they have to have something that helps them decide their rates. Um, we hope, we would think, we would like them to think that maybe what we have is some data that might help them as well think about their rates. Um, uh, but insurance data also sets a Availability of the laws, laws around insuring property, and also the um, the uh, amount of available for around insurance also would help us think through the value of those pieces of property. I was thinking real estate records. Uh huh. You know, because those are spatial as well. You know, price sold in different years. Does any Does anybody have that? There are commercial data sets available. CoreLogic sells. Uh, you can buy licenses to these data sets. They're kind Real of just got it. Right? I, well, yeah, and they sell them. And, and you, so you can get all transactions in the country, all real estate transactions, with lots of information about them. Uh, would there be enough people on UW campus who would want that for other so purposes? We, <laughs> on my previous campus, we negotiated a campus to buy licenses. Yeah. And, uh, that would be we could probably work with the libraries on that. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of really interesting uses of those data. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so these are just general population trends, but have you looked at the age cohorts or uh, male and female patterns? And yeah, we're, um, if, so IPMs would be the source for some of those data, um, but getting annualized rates is a little harder to do, so we don't have those yet. Um, I'm going out there in mid-March to talk to them. Yeah, exactly. But IPMS is the um, integrated population uh, public use, public use micro sample, right? <laughs>
stands, which is uh, uh, used draws on the census data, the Cato census data. So, does it? Did you want to ask your question? Yeah, I, it's more of a nitty. It's less about like this specific research and more about the nitty gritty of like counties in the U.S. Okay. Um, but <laughs> I remember like the first time seeing a county map, noticing how much smaller the counties are on the east coast than the west coast, uh -huh. and I'm wondering, is that helpful, or would you, if you could redraw all the county lines, would you want to redraw them in a way to like? make it more even in terms of like population or like size, geographic size. <laughs> Making one of my geography friends you know better a better answer to this. But um, uh, I wouldn't want to so the most important thing from my perspective is that they those boundaries stay the same. Right. That's the main main yeah. thing over yeah. time. <laughs> um, and yeah. I mean, we could, could we can control for the area, which we haven't really done. I'm not sure. But obviously, that's in the density measure. But um, I don't know what would be your answer to that. It depends on the question. Yes. Um, uniform areas are nice. But, uh, I mean, the the fact is, for our purposes, so get back to the earlier comment, the complexity. Um, Administrative units, administrative boundaries are important because they help also structure the flows of resources and the institutional institutional arrangements. So that would be harder to um, if we were to blow that up and use some other form of measuring. That. <laughs> so again, that relates back to what depends on what the question is. That's usually my answer in GIS related questions. <laughs> depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question. Great to have you. Thank you. Thanks.